Hello, I'm Philip Huber. I'm a professional puppeteer. I've designed, built, and I perform Paul the Dog in the show Darling Grenadine. Well, I think it, the start of my career was a rather small but very significant event. My mother gave me a puppet when I was only three years old. And uh, I believe she gave it to me because she noticed that I was extremely shy. But I also enjoyed all of the puppetry that I was seeing on television as a youngster. But to actually have this puppet to be the center of attention, and it was a little hand puppet dog, coincidentally. Dogs have followed me my whole career. But uh, to have that puppet be the center of attention and I could duck down behind a sofa or something, that created a wonderful experience for me. And uh, so that, I think, was the start. And people noticed that I was very interested in these puppets. So then they started giving me hand puppets for gifts uh, for birthdays or Christmas or any special event that they happened to come up. And I ended up collecting several hundred of them by the time I was seven years old and doing shows. However, I was also interested in dance and theater in general. But I started dance lessons when I was only six. And uh, so I was frustrated with the hand puppets because they have no lower body. So all the dance movement has to happen just within the upper body and the hands and head. And, but I discovered marionettes and I got my first marionette, which is a type of puppet worked by strings. Uh, I got that when I was only five years old. And uh, it was on, constantly tangled. So it's not like I was a natural at performing with it. My father would hang it from a floor lamp. He would carefully untangle it and then hand it back to me. And a few minutes later, it would be a mess again. So I, I just kept working with the hand puppets mostly. But every once in a while, I would go to the marionettes. Because again, I had the full body. So I could make them walk and run and jump. And they could fly through the air and things like that. So they had so much more expressiveness than just the hand puppet. By the time I was 11, I really wanted to do the marionettes. I wanted something more challenging. And so I got very serious about it then. And my mother bought me these puppets that were made in England. And they were called Pelham puppets. They were toy puppets, but they were made out of wood. And they had metal joints. And they were very well done. And they worked well, except, of course, I never allowed them to work just the way they were made. I would change the stringing on them. My mother would make new costumes for them. And I would create a whole different character for some of the ones that I purchased. But I started doing shows with that. By the time I was 15, I was very precocious and decided to declare myself professional. And I created, I started building my own marionettes. Now, I had nobody to show me how to do it. So I just had to experiment around. And fortunately, I went to the library. I got all the books I could on puppets. And I started building from the instructions in the library books. And my first puppet was uh, for a history project in high school. And it was Abraham Lincoln. And he gave the Gettysburg Address in class. And I got extra credit points for that. But I wanted to use him for something else. He was a historical puppet. But the shows I was creating at that time were variety shows. They weren't uh, the fairy tales that I had started out with. And variety shows meant that I could appeal to any age range audience. And any audience, whether they spoke English or not, it had no language barrier. So uh, Abraham Lincoln became a song and dance man. I put a little mustache on him, put a cane in his hand. And he could do cane tricks and, and tap dance. And my second puppet was a marionette, specifically was a dancer. And I made her an art class in high school. She was called Lotta Wiggle. And she would come out and just do a lot of wiggle. And uh, so then I continued on from that and continued building characters. I had started out with the commercial puppets. And they would, they would do certain tricks. I, I had a little dog commercial puppet that did all sorts of tricks as well on stage. And uh, I worked my way through high school and college doing shows. 
And then when I was ready to go to college, I decided I better be a theater major because, of course, puppetry is just another form of theater. And a puppeteer is actually an actor who's expressing himself through a different body, which is the, the puppet, whether it's a hand puppet, marionette, costume character, whatever. And uh, so, but my mother said to me before I left for college, be sure and study something that you can earn a living with. I don't think she quite trusted that puppetry would be a career. But at any rate, I went off and I worked my way, like I said, through college, even doing shows in, when I had free time. But I was a theater major. When I graduated from college, I was ready to work for a professional puppeteer. I wanted to apprentice. So I applied with only one puppeteer that I discovered and he lived in Los Angeles. His name was Tony Urbano. And uh, I discovered him because he had done shows on the, uh, the Dean Martin show on television. And I'd seen these beautiful marionettes that I was so impressed with. And uh, they were advertised as being Sid and Marty Croft puppets, but I didn't realize that this puppeteer, Tony Urbano, had actually worked for them. And uh, so I started working for, uh, I actually applied with him before I graduated. I sent him a video of my work and he hired me just from the video, gave me a plane ticket to fly out to California. I forgot to mention that I was raised in Northern Illinois here. I was born in Belvedere, Illinois and raised in Dixon, Illinois. So this was my big break. I was flown out to Los Angeles and I started working for him and apprenticed for eight years before I once again established my own company. And then the rest is, is kind of history for me. It's, it's all the wonderful things I've been able to do in film, stage, and television, as well as live, live theater. Well, with puppeteering, you really need to study theater, number one. It's good if you know dance. Uh, all the things that, that a theater art major would want to know, you need to know as a puppeteer. And I've used it all in my career. Uh, but it's good to apprentice with a professional if you can. And if not, it's good to find a place to study where they can actually uh, help you develop the skills it takes to work with different types of puppets. And it's good to study all different types, hand puppets, rod puppets, shadow puppets, as well as marionettes. And they also do tabletop puppets, which is similar to a Japanese style called bunraku. Uh, all of those types are needed at various times in television commercials and live stage shows and things like that. So it's good to be able to go University of Connecticut is a prime place to attend because they actually offer a master's degree in puppetry. There are a few other places. The CalArts in Los Angeles also has a puppetry department. But another place is the O'Neill Theater Center in Waterford, Connecticut, and they offer a puppetry conference every year for one week. It's very intensive, and all of the instructors they bring in are professional puppeteers. A lot of them are the Muppet puppeteers as well as others, and I teach usually in what they call the marionette strand. So to study even a week there, you could get established in some of the uh, techniques that you need to master. It was interesting because when I was first approached about Darling Grenadine, I was actually working in Germany at the time, and a producer from uh, Goodspeed Theater in, in Connecticut uh, contacted me and said uh, they were planning to do this show, Darling Grenadine, and there was a dog in it that was going to be a marionette. So I was interested, of course, and they sent me the script, and they even sent me recordings of some of the music. And once I read the script, I was blown away by it. I thought, yes, I definitely would like to do this. But I needed to talk to the director and the, the author, of course, Daniel Zychik. And uh, I had a Skype conference call with the two of them, and they kind of talked to me about what they envisioned as the dog. And it was interesting because I asked Daniel, first of all, why a marionette in the show? And uh, he said, well, of course, they needed a dog that was an actor, number one. 
and could be dependable, and that's really important because the dog has very specific cues, has to be certain places at certain times, and interacting with the live actors. And he felt that marionettes created the most lifelike performance on stage, and I enjoyed hearing that. And then I said, well, how do you envision this dog? What does it look like? What breed? And he said he wanted it to be a black lab. And I said, well, black is difficult because usually a puppeteer is dressed in black. And so black blends into the shadows. And even the face of a black lab would be indistinct. You wouldn't see the eyes very well. And I recommended that he do a lighter color for the lab. And he didn't want it to be a yellow lab or a white lab, so I said, how about a silver lab? And he said, great, that, that sounds good. So then we, we compromised with that. And some of the other things they gave me was the director at that time said something about, how about steampunk for the dog? Could we see gears and all sorts of mechanisms with the dog? And I said, well, that's a possibility. Uh, sometimes it's difficult because those types of things catch strings. And Daniel said one statement that really stood out to me. He said, I want the dog to be an incomplete idea. And basically, the dog in the show is in the mind of the lead character, Harry. And so it's what Harry remembers about his dog and what he loves about his dog, but it's not really complete. And because of that, I designed the dog in such a way that it shows off the joints. Uh, the screws that are used in the joints are very visible. The, they wanted the legs to be left natural wood, and he didn't want it covered with a fur cloth. So I found a special cloth that I described as lint, dryer lint on, on a white screen. And that was uh, what he liked. I sent him pictures of that. I found it in Germany. And I designed out the dog, spent uh, weeks doing that. And then when I actually got home from Germany, I started the construction. It takes about 400 hours to build one marionette. And uh, because he wanted it as a complete idea, I even put uh, a netting on part of the neck and on part of the torso so people can see through it. And that was, that was the basis of, of the dog then going into the show. Okay, Paul the dog. Uh, the challenge, of course, with the marionette is you have very long legs. And it's always difficult to get them to work, to, to walk properly for a dog. But he has actually strings that I call internal strings, and they're just down on his legs. And they help the paw to return to a flat position when I lower down again. So it makes it a little bit easier when he's, he's walking all four legs. The paws will return back to the stage easily. His head, of course, has a great deal of flexibility on a very loose neck there, and you can see the netting. He has a spinal cord that runs all the way through the dog, and it's wood beads in the neck. And then farther out, it's these plastic, like wiffle balls that are inside his body. The other challenge is to get the tail to work well in, in time when I don't have enough free hands to do something special with the tail. When he sits, it takes the weight off, and he can wag the tail like that. And he can lay down. He has an animated mouth that opens, and he has a tongue that can be thrust out so he can pant, and he can also lick. The tongue goes out so he can lick one of the actors and get it very excited. His ears need to have a great deal of expression, so he has ears that move forward and back as a lab does. But he even has a special movement with the ears where he can lift them a little bit. And labs do lift their ears, but not quite as much as this. And we, I overemphasized it a little bit for the stage. So it gives him a little bit of a humorous effect when he's working as well. So he can be sad and he can, he can be worried about things looking down. Or he can be really bright and, and happy and, 
and excited and very alert. And he has the capability of scratching. So that's kind of, Paul just reacts like a real dog in the show and the actors just work with him as if he's a real dog. They pet him, they scratch his ear, he walks on a leash, he can play ball, he can do a lot of different things. Well, like I said, a puppeteer is an actor and they're actually acting through another body. So when Paul is on stage, my whole being is absorbed through him. I see things through his eyes. I feel things for him, through him. So, and he, he expresses it in his body action. So I don't exist. I become a shadow on stage. And uh, the actors don't even know that I'm there. They, I don't exist for them either. And so it's only Paul. I dress in black usually so that I do blend into the shadows, go into the background, and that's the idea of, of Paul being a lighter color so that he will jump out and forward for the audience. It's interesting because I've never played in the round before, and that for me is a challenge. I'm always conscious of where my body exists so that I try and keep it out of the way of masking it from audience members, from masking the puppet or another actor. And in this particular case, uh, I feel a little bit freer actually because I can't, I know that I can't stay out of the way all the time. I'm always going to be in the way of somebody. So it's just I, I have to, I feel free to do things like a complete circle in the round and and uh, that that's kind of freeing and yeah i don't i don't think uh, his his personality has changed much but i think it's just my consciousness technique of what i have to do with the character that's changed <laughs>